so the first thing they did was do a transfusion and then brain surgery so i ended up with a, a hole which i still got here there's only skin over it where they put in a drain tube to drain off the fluid and they took about a fist sized lump of skull out the back of my head at the base of my uh, skull so that that's still missing uh, to give my brain room to swell into in the hope that when the swelling went down the fluid would drain out naturally and I'd be okay which luckily it was they, they did say look if we can't get the fluid draining out normally we, we put a, a stent in which is effectively a bit of guttering that goes from your head down in, and just drains just drains the fluid away This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis, helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to episode 206 of the Recovery After Stroke podcast. My name is Bill Gassiamis. If you are a stroke survivor with a story to share about your experience with stroke and you have been thinking about reaching out, to be a guest on the show, but we're waiting for the right time to reach out. Well, this is it. If you go to recoveryafterstroke.com forward slash contact, you'll find a form that you can fill out, apply to be a guest on the show. And as soon as I receive it, I will respond with more details on how you can choose a time that works for you and for me to meet over Zoom and record an episode. My guest today is Andy Dovey a musician who experienced an ischemic cerebellar stroke in 2013, who is still living with some of the deficits today that the stroke caused and left him with. And at the moment, he has not been able to return to work. Andy Dovey, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. Uh, tell me a little bit about what happened to you, mate. Yeah, crikey. Um, I suppose like, uh, like many of us, um, I had no idea what a stroke was. I'd, I'd, I'd heard the word stroke. I thought it was something to do with your heart, some kind of mild heart issue. Had no idea that it was a, a brain injury. So um, at the time it happened, which was May, the end of May 2013, I was uh, earning my crust as a professional musician, a, a drummer. And I was teaching in schools, teaching in my home studio, and also playing, gigging with bands and so on. And um, it was the midterm break in the UK, spring break. So I had a week of no teaching, but I had a load of music to learn for the various bands that I was playing in and stuff. So I had a, a very leisurely week planned. And it was, I suppose, about 5.30 one morning, and I, I heard a really loud bang. That, that woke me up and there was kind of a vibration with it and I thought maybe it was our side gate had banged in the wind or something had happened outside or whatever I don't know but I sat bolt upright in bed and then just crashed back down on the pillow again when I realized that actually you know there was nothing happening outside and I started to feel unwell a bit kind of uh, nauseous like I wanted to to, to throw up so I thought I better I better head for the bathroom. So I went to get out of bed and just collapsed into a heap on the floor, and the room was just spinning. Well, the world was spinning around and spinning around. Like I don't know if you've ever made yourself dizzy as an as an adult, Bill. How about how about drank myself to oblivion? How about that? Well, the the analogy I use. <laughs> is it's that game that you play when you've had a few beers and you're having a barbecue outside and and you somebody puts a broom down right and you're looking to, and, and you run around the broom mm -hmm, i know the one and then you stand up and then you just disappear to one side normally end up in a rhododendron bush or something you know <laughs> but it was just it was just like that only that feeling that you get when you do that wears off after 15 20 seconds and the world gradually comes back to normal mm. And you pull yourself out of the road to dendron bushes and, and life carries on. But it was like that all the time. It was the most bizarre feeling. And I had this horrendous, I, I, I nicknamed it later the force, as in Star Wars, but this force pulling me to the left. It was like gravity and a huge magnet was pulling me to the left. And I, I, I couldn't get off the ground. So I'm literally on my hands and knees trying to crawl to the bathroom. 
and all this thrashing around and banging into furniture and stuff has woken my wife up. She says to me, yeah, okay. I said, yeah, I'm just not feeling too good, hon. I need to get to the bathroom. And I tried to crawl in a straight line and I couldn't. I kept going to the left. This, this force was pulling me to the left and I couldn't bring my head up. My head was hanging down. It just, it just like, I guess if you're a test pilot and you're pulling 10G or something, it's, it, it's like that. Anyway, most bizarre. So I eventually made it to the bathroom and I hauled myself up. Luckily, because of the drumming, and I played a lot of sport as a kid, I've got quite good upper body strength. So I literally hauled myself up onto the toilet. And I'm kneeling on the floor with my head over the toilet bowl, retching. And when I was 16, my dad was 54, and uh, he had a heart attack. And the last image I had of him before he died was kneeling over a toilet bowl, retching. Wow. Wow. So I'm there and I'm thinking I'm going to go the same way as my dad. I'm, I'm, I'm having a heart attack. I didn't have any pain. I had no shooting pains or anything. I just felt really awful and just thought this is, this is what it is. How ironic. He was 54. I then was 55. I'm now 64. I thought I'm, <laughs> this is talk about karma. I'm going to go the same way as my dad. Retching, kneeling over a toilet bowl. Um, now, my I'm wife gonna, by this time had, sorry, go on. That's pretty dramatic, but I'm going to take you back for a second because I, I picked up something and, and you're going to, you're going to elaborate on this for me. So I'll try. You fell out of bed. You were crawling to the toilet. Your wife asked you, are you okay? Is everything okay? Yeah. You responded yes, even though <laughs> you were crawling to the bloody toilet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, she 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 subsequently nicknamed me the Black Knight uh -huh. for Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Uh -huh. Only a flesh wound, <laughs> only, a only a scratch. There he is with no legs, no arms. It's like come back here, I'll bite your knees off. That's, that's, that's so she nicknamed me. She's nicknamed me the Black Knight. Unbelievable. Yeah. Were you I, were you in you denial know, or were you just not cognitively aware of how serious the situation was? Like. What was the frame of mind? Did you have a frame of mind? Um, very good question, Bill. Um, there was an element of denial. And I, I think um, something we might come on to, I, I had uh, probably about 16 months of uh, neuropsychology visits, which, which were fantastic. And I think looking back now, what happened to me was seeing my dad die age 16. And that was never spoken about within the family after with my brother, my sister or my mother, never spoken about. And I went back to college and life carried on as, as normal. And I think that became my default position was, was wired into me at the age of 16. You don't talk about stuff, you get on with it. Now, my dad was a professional cricketer. I played a lot of cricket as a young person. And, you know, you get hit by a cricket ball, it hurts. Mm. But you're taught, just get on with it. Now, when I was playing age 14, 15 in men's cricket, helmet, no, they weren't invented. So you get helped in the head a few times with a cricket ball. Thigh pad, didn't start wearing a thigh pad till I was about 16. So you're getting hit quite regularly on the top of the thigh between the pad and, you know, all you had was a, box protector to protect your privates and that was it no arm like we'll see all the guys these days they have mm. stuff up their arms and none of that so you got hit a lot you just get on with it and that became my default position i think and there, there's this element too isn't there that we're men we're blokes we're all tough and hard and you know we can we can handle it and all that kind of stuff so mm -hmm. i think there's that that was the background in terms of cognition I, I didn't know just I didn't know what the hell was going on it was just the the world was spinning around my head was really heavy I felt lousy I, I and because of this bathroom issue I just assumed it was a heart attack even though I'd got no chest pains I'd got no pains up my arm or anything like that I just assumed that's what it was so ultimately the parent my wife had called 999 emergency services the paramedics came out um 
I, none of the fast, you know, face arms, you know, none of that applied to me. I didn't know it. I was having a, a cerebellar stroke, hence the dizziness and the balance mm. and all the rest of it. Mm. So I could talk. I was quite, um, quite competent talking. I didn't have any issues. My face wasn't drooping. Speech was fine. Mm. Uh, just felt weird, oh. awful. Yeah. And so I said to them, I think I'm having a heart attack. Uh, this happened to my dad they did uh, a, a, an ecg there and then said no yeah, yeah your heart's fine we think it's labyrinthitis which is an infection of the inner ear that's what's giving you the balance problems so they gave me an anti-nausea injection and uh, off they disappeared so by this stage it's probably 7 30 in the morning something like that i managed to get back to bed uh, the paramedics have said to my wife if he's no better call the doctors and you know what have you so at nine o'clock she called the doctors they prescribed some more anti-nausea meds she went and picked up a prescription cashed cashed in the prescription came back i took some more pills sitting up in bed just everything bizarre the doctors had said look if he's no better by lunchtime we'll do a house visit so my gp came out at one o'clock and said touch the end of your nose with your right forefinger it's like fine yeah there we go do it with your left forefinger so i did and my hand just went and i nearly punched myself in the face i hit the pillow behind me and he said i think you've had a stroke so he phoned 999 again paramedic different team came out and i was taken in a wheelchair to hospital and i vaguely remember getting to a and e a and e uh, accident and emergency mm -hmm. The, the emergency department, I vaguely remember getting there. And the next thing I know that I'm conscious of is that um, my stepdaughter is is there. And it's like, what, what are you doing here, Claire? You should be at work. I, I've come to see you to make sure you're okay. She was with my wife. I thought, because she's, she's got here quick. She lives in London. It's about an hour away, but I've just got to A&E and, she, and, she, and she's here. And then there's lots of beeping and machines beeping. I just wish these machines would shut up. I need mm. to get some sleep. The next thing is there's a three-dimensional screensaver all around me. And you've probably seen on the TV lava volcanoes lava pools and it and they bubble and there's these slow moving bubbles come up green uh, yellows oranges reds beautiful colors that's all around me with these bubbles coming up and one of these bubbles comes up and there's a little black dot in the middle and it's it, it develops into an eye and it's the eye of a dog and i see this dog's head slowly come out of this lava pool beautiful lovely little spaniel and then it just disappears and there's another bubble with another black dot in and then that becomes another eye and that's another dog and that just disappears off and then there's another bubble comes up and there's another black dot in and that comes this monster and it leaps up at me and it's what the hell and i find my eyes are open and i'm sitting up in a hospital bed it's like what the what is going on and there's just nurses going about their business. There's other guys sitting in beds around me. And it's like, oh, I just feel really awful. And my eyes close. And now I realise what's happening. It's an hallucination mm -hmm. with the lava and the dogs and the monster. And that starts all over again until I get shocked and my eyes open. And I'm trying to keep my eyes open, but I can't. I don't realise it, but this is now five days later. And I'm in the neurosurgery ward of the hospital. And I've had six hours of emergency brain surgery. Already. Already, yeah. 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 And I guess the hallucinations are partly the meds that they've given me for the for the brain surgery. Partly, I didn't realise it. I've developed hydrocephalus. Are you familiar with yeah. hydrocephalus? Yeah, yeah, fluid on the brain. Basically, yeah. So what had happened, apparently, was that I'd spent two days in the stroke ward which i have no memory of whatsoever where my wife would come to see me and i'd be slumped in bed the doctors would come around and i'd switch into what my wife calls performance mode 
like I'm on stage at a gig or something, right? Pretending everything's okay. Pretend, well, you know, as you, as you can probably appreciate, if you're feeling a bit ill, right, you can't just say, I, don't, I can't do it tonight, lads. I can't do, I can't do the gig tonight. Because you're not only letting down the rest of the band, you're letting down the whole audience and, you know. A, a you're a bloke. B, yeah. you, don't talk, you don't talk about your problems. C, you cop the pain at cricket. You just move on with it. Uh, and D, um, the show must go on. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it you might be everything if it, if working it, if against it, you. Yeah, absolutely, mate. Absolutely. And, it, you know, if it's, um, if it's, a, if it's a, a gig in a, you know, for, for a fun band, you're playing with some mates or something, that's fine. But you might be playing at a wedding and it, you've been, getting paid two grand to do somebody's wedding so you can't just say oh, i can't do it sorry you carry on so whether your back's bad or whether you're throwing up in a bucket every every two songs at the side of the stage or whatever you you you, you carry on so the doctors would come and see me and i'd be hi i'm andy pleased to meet you your name is oh i'm pleased to meet you. Oh, okay how are you feeling oh yeah fine my wife's sitting there thinking what you can't you know the doctor would disappear and i go Ugh. <laughs> <laughs> so so two days of this my wife would say to them look something's not right he that there's something going, i don't know what it is but it's not he's fine when you're here but the minute you go he's he's weird he's saying to me he wants some paracetamol and i say to him you've just had some no i haven't yes you have so she persuaded a, a lady consultant that something wasn't right and the lady consultant said look okay we've been told that we must listen to family members because they know the patient better than we do. And she, the lady consultant, wheeled me down for an MRI. They did an MRI and it was like, oh, he's got hydrocephalus. Wow. We need to do emergency brain surgery. So what had happened was that the stroke, which was in my cerebellum, had caused my brain to swell and my brain had swollen against the back of my skull mm -hmm. and was preventing most of the cerebrospinal fluid from draining out of my brain. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I'm still develop, I'm still producing CSF and my brain is slowly being crushed by the pressure of the fluid that I'm producing, which is, which is hydrocephalus. So I had to have, first of all, I had to have a transfusion because they've been filling me with aspirin and, you know, stuff. <laughs> Not ideal if you're going to have six hours of brain surgery. surgery. Yeah, and your blood and your blood's like and your blood's like water. So you go from having a clot to maybe bleeding out. Yeah. Um, if you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind, like how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. So the first thing they did was do a transfusion and then brain surgery. So I ended up with a a hole which I've still got here, there's only skin over it, where they put in a drain tube to drain off the fluid. And they took about a fist sized lump of skull out of the back of my head at the base of my uh, skull. So that, that's still missing. Uh, to give my brain room to swell into in the hope that when the swelling went down, the fluid would drain out naturally and I'd be okay, which luckily it was. They, they did say, look, if we can't, get the fluid draining out normally we, we put a, a stent in which is effectively a bit of guttering that goes from your head down in, and just drains just drains the fluid away i like, love that analogy it's a little bit of guttering yeah. <laughs> That's I, like, awesome. I, I like to keep 
I like to keep things simple, mate. That's the yeah, yeah. way I work. I totally understand guttering in your head. I totally get it. Yeah. Yeah. When it rains. Yeah. I get it. So, um, so that was it. So I found myself sitting up in the neurosurgery ward once these hallucinate hallucinations had worn off trying to absorb all of this stuff that had happened to me right and and that is i think for all of us a huge challenge I, i've seen a, a, a bit about your your story so you you know we're obviously on the same page as that i'll just carry on yeah, fine yeah what mm. so i know i've got this meeting we've got a meeting to go to right so yeah mm. um but then you reach a point where you've got to absorb what's happened. Now, the longest I'd ever been ill was off work, you know, a couple of weeks with a bad back or something. So I'm sitting up in hospital bed. I've got a tube, a drain tube coming out of my head here. I've got another one coming out of my back here. I've got an IV in this arm. I've got an IV in this arm. I've got a catheter fitted and, and a sat on it. And I'm thinking, uh, where are we? Early June. Yeah, well, I don't know, probably six, seven weeks I'll be back at work. Fine. <laughs> no comprehension, no understanding of, of, of what had happened, the magnitude of it, the seriousness of it. I can't get out of bed on my own. I can't walk. If I, I've got a catheter fitted, so that's fine. If I need to go number twos, I've got to call a nurse. I've got to have two nurses to get me out of bed, put me on a commode, wheel me to the toilet. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be back at work in in six weeks, drumming. All right, there. let's fast and, forward and, really quickly to how yep. long did it take to get back to work? I want to make a point here. I haven't. Right. Okay. Nine, so. nine, 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 nine years later, I I haven't. I can walk short distances with a stick. Now I can sit and I can communicate and I look okay. I'll spend the next two days recovering from this call. I've spent two days preparing for it because I suffer from very bad fatigue, neuro fatigue. So I, I haven't made it back to work. Wow. Okay. So the point I wanted to try to make is, is there'll be people listening that are just very early on in their recovery yeah. journey. And what they've yeah. done is already given themselves a deadline. I'm going to be back in two weeks, in three weeks, whatever it is. And that was me. And one of the biggest disappointments in my recovery, the things that set me back a lot was the deadlines that I gave myself that were, uh, <laughs> that were unrealistic because again I didn't understand yeah. the gravity of the situation and then I kept yep. feeling bad oh my god I still am not there and I'm still not there and when I coach people on their own stroke recovery journey one of the things I say to them is improvement every day no deadlines just improvement every day and try and reach little milestones and the milestones are smaller shorter windows of this kind of smaller little, um, well, they're milestones. They're not deadlines. There's not a hard and fast. I must get there. They're just milestones. They're in the future. And one day we'll get yeah. there. And that yeah. is kind of what I wanted to make a point of it. Now, tell me about this whole last nine years. You've come out of hospital and are you straight at home? What happens there? Do you go into rehabilitation first? No, they... Um... <laughs> I, I kind of uh, put pressure on them to discharge me and send me home. Uh, they, there was talk about me going to a rehab facility. I didn't want to go to a rehab facility because I, 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 I think it took me several years to, to get it. So I was in hospital for three weeks and after about after I moved out of the neurosurgery ward back to the stroke ward where I had been but had no memory of so all the staff are going oh hello Mr Dobie how are you it's like who are you what hey eh? well don't you remember when you first came in no I've never met you who are, who are you know but they started some basic physiotherapy with me um which I couldn't do anything of because they're working to standard sheets so as an example stand up for 30 seconds and look up at the ceiling. Now I couldn't I couldn't stand up full stop without people either side of me because I've still at this stage got no balance whatsoever. So and then put your foot on a step in front of me, 
just one step at a time like this. Well, I could I could do that, providing somebody was holding me on my left, but I couldn't get my left foot off the ground. It was like super glued to the floor. Mm. So the only thing I could do was parallel bars, shuffle along, parallel bars, turn around and shuffle back again. And the only reason I could do that, because I've got good upper body strength. And they're saying to me, you've got to get 50 points before you can go home. First score, 20 or something, you know. So the gym became, in my head, the room of abject despair because every time I went in there, got to get 50 points, got to get 50 points, and I was getting 20, 22, 20. You know. And it's like, how the hell am I going to get – and trust me, I couldn't do it now, Bill. Mm. I couldn't get 50, 50 points now, right? right. So I, technically I should still be there nine, <laughs> nine years later. Now – Eventually, what happened was um, then I had physiotherapy and I had OT. So the OT would come to me and say, well, let's go and make a cup of tea. And in my head, I'm thinking occupation. That's that's drumming. That's work. Brilliant. This is going to be stuff to help me get back to work. Make a cup of tea. Yeah, fine. Right. Whatever. Make some toast. Yeah. OK, fine. Then she came to me one day and said uh, uh, <laughs> she had some uh, marbles and some paper clips. Now. One of the results of my surgery and stroke was that I had really bad double vision. So I had horizontal double vision and vertical double vision and nystigmus, which is your eyes flicker around, right? Mm -hmm. And she's trying to get me to daisy chain paper clips. Now, I can't really grip anything in my left hand. So straight away, I'm thinking, how the hell am I going to hold a drumstick? I can't get back to work. How am I going to earn money? I can't get back to work. So I'm having to force a paper clip into my left hand to grip it and then try and daisy chain another paper clip into it and i've got double vision so i've got four paper clips here four paper clips here i know i'll close one eye brilliant so i've got one paper clip one paper clip but no depth perception <laughs> so i can't do any of this stuff and i'm getting really really frustrated so the ot came to me one day and said let's make a cake shall we oh my and i just i lost it I just lost it. I just completely lost it. And I just turned over in fetal position and said, no, not doing it. I'm on strike. <laughs> I convinced I'm the only man in history ever to have gone on strike in, the, in, a, in a stroke ward. And I, I just I said, no, I can't, Suzanne, I can't, I don't see the point in doing any of this. I'm down at the gym. I can't do any of the work. I, this stuff that you're doing, I can't, I can't. I've had a cerebellar stroke. I've got no balance. I can't see the point in what, what we're trying to do. I just want to go home. So anyway, they had a meeting and it was like, yeah, we only, we only see about 2% of strokes, cerebellar strokes. We, we don't really see them. We don't really understand them. Yeah, all our stuff is geared up for your bog standard if there is such a thing so yeah you can go home but when that you can go home today so i was i basically put pressure on them by being a bolshy bastard and uh and they 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 they, they uh they let me go home with a bag of meds and, and a wheelchair mistake now looking back um possibly possibly not i think the thing is that <laughs> I don't know whether it's better sometimes to learn through trial and error. I mean, my my basic personality, Bill, my, my wife would tell you I'm stubborn. I will say I'm determined. So put it this way, if you're going to learn to play drums and you're going to learn all the various stickings, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, left, right, left, right, right, left, right, left, you know, you, any musical instrument, whatever it is, you're going to have to be a certain mindset, which is I'm going to do this. I don't care if I've got blisters on my hands. I don't care if I've got bruises. I'm going to do this. So I think through sheer determination, I kind of worked out what to do. I did have physio and OT visit me at home. I did go to a wonderful place called the Oxford Centre for Enablement. I was living near Oxford in the south of England at the time. And uh, this was a, a, an outpatient. I was an outpatient there. You could be an inpatient there, but I was an outpatient. and the first time I went there, I felt like a fraud because I'm walking in doddering on my stick and there's guys in wheelchairs 
and a lot of ex-servicemen are having been fitted for prosthetic legs. They've had their legs blown off in Afghanistan and stuff. And I'm thinking, what am I? What am I doing? What? Still beating be yourself up. Be, still beating yourself up about it. Still, you haven't. Correct. You haven't been scarred or damaged or battered enough to be there, uh, feeling like yeah. a fraud, like a like an imposter. Completely. Yeah. Yeah. Ab- ab- absolutely. Absolutely. And it wasn't until I, it was about six months after my stroke, I had to go and have a, 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 another MRI. And I had a panic attack because I've discovered now one of the outcomes of the stroke is that I have chronic claustrophobia. Never had it before. Quite happy, pot, I've been potholing, caving, all kinds of stuff. Now even the thought of being in a small room freaks me out. My wife accidentally locked me in the car once. <laughs> I I completely lost it. Completely lost it. Anyway, so I had this MR, MRI. So the door? Gone. You couldn't open the door? Unlock no, it? no. She, she, we, we parked up. She was going to our local pharmacist to pick up some meds. And she, she didn't think. She, as she crossed the road to the pharmacy, she just went beep. And lock me in the car. Just, just have it, you know. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get out. It's a hot day. I like this. No, I can't breathe. And I just, I'm banging on the window. There's a guy walking past saying, "My wife is in the pharmacy. I, she's locked me in. Not, not deliberately. And I'm trying to. Oh, uh, anyway. So, <laughs> so I had a, I had a meltdown in a, in an MRI scanner, and. Yeah. Uh, I, I, when I got outside, I, I just burst into tears, and um, I did I, that. I, it was like I've, I, I've, I've got a, I've got a problem. I, I did that. Problem. I did that. I'll tell you what happened to me is really before the stroke uh, in 2012, I had a shoulder injury from going to the gym, and it was right. a, it was a tear in my rotator cuff muscle in my back, and in order to work out where the tear was, they asked me to go and get an MRI. And on the way there, I'd seen somebody uh, who had been hit by a car uh, covered with a sheet on the freeway. Right. Just by coincidence, just drove past the person, was a cyclist, got hit by a car, was covered because he had passed away. So I'm I'm heading to this appointment, you know, a bit stunned and whatever. And then I've gone to go into the MRI machine, first time ever. I didn't know what, what it was about. And then they told me, when you go in there, this lady was quite terrible at communicating what was necessary. She goes, you've got to go in there. It's 30 minutes and you can't move. I said, well, who can go into a machine and not move for 30 minutes? What she didn't tell me was that the scans take about two or three minutes each. Then there's a pause. Then you go back in and then so on. And and I, I went in and they kind of, got started on the first scan i said nah get me out of here i'm not doing this for 50 or for 30 minutes solid who the hell can do that and if i move i'm not doing it again there's no chance get me out of there anyway so literally three or four months later i'm in hospital now dealing with brain hemorrhages and there's an mri every three seconds so in order in order to go through the mri i had them sedate me so now I'm going through this whole process over the three years that I had my brain hemorrhages and brain surgery. Uh, right. I would have had, I had countless MRIs. I don't remember how many I had. And, um, and then I was having them after surgery for three years to check my progress, to see how the brain settling down, all the usual stuff. And then by the, the last couple, I said, no, nah, fuck this. I am not going to be sedated any more for my MRIs. I'm going to go in there yeah. and I'm going to breathe through them. So what I did is I practiced, uh, I put some meditation music on, you know, when they ask you to put music on for right. you, I asked them to put some meditation yeah. music on, closed my eyes. And I had practiced before going into the machines. I'd practiced a lot. And then I would go into the machines, close my eyes, and then I would breathe for six seconds in and six seconds out. And I would count six seconds in, six seconds out. And that was how I freed myself from the claustrophobia wow. and the issue that wow. I had with the MRIs. And also the other issue of being sedated every time. It, it can't be good for you to be sedated mm. often. And I thought, nah, 
I'm not doing this anymore. And I don't want my wife to take a day off work to come and pick me up again because I can't drive home. So mm. I was going to, uh, I was going to be go there independently, drive my car, have the MRI without sedation, and then jump in the car and go home. So I know how you feel because man, those first, well, those lots of MRIs were difficult to overcome the, the, the fear and the thought that was, you know, coming in my mind days before or the day before or the night before or whatever. And then it's like, no, nah, stuff it. I'm not doing that anymore. Um, and that's yeah, yeah. kind of how I got through it. Good for you. Good for you. I, I, I need to take a, a lesson from that. Um, yeah, just coming back, actually just made me think of something that you said earlier about uh, what you do with your coaching, mm. that um, you don't have fixed time scales, you don't have deadlines. Mm. Um, my first session with the occupational therapist out of hospital, when I was an outpatient at the Oxford Centre for Enablement, uh, was about planning out my week. What, 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 what was planning out my week? What, what you're going to do? How you're going to do it? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And uh, I turned up at my next session with a spreadsheet. <laughs> right, five columns: Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Because I thought I have Saturday and Sunday off. Right, nine to five. Every half an hour, what I'm going to do for five days of the week. Nine, starting at nine, finishing at five. Nine, nine thirty, ten, ten thirty. Right. Half lunch. Right. She was in, really blown away by this. She said, "This is this is really impressive." Okay. When I went back to see her the following week, I was almost in tears because I hadn't done any of it. Mm. wasn't cap wasn't capable of doing any of it. Started the Monday, felt really awful. Did try to do one or two things, couldn't do any of them, carried them over to the Tuesday. This 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 then kind of carried on. So I had all this wonderful looked on paper, it looked absolutely fantastic. The reality was it was way beyond my capabilities. Way beyond. So I got demoralized, mm -hmm. depressed, demotivated, because I'm giving myself these deadlines which at the time, I didn't realize it, were completely unrealistic, mm. completely unachievable. And all I'm doing is I'm now beating myself up with a large sledgehammer mm. because I'm failing to achieve what I thought I could achieve. Mm. Mm. And that was a huge that was a huge lesson uh, for me because, I, I, it, it, again, it was all part of this thinking, I'll be back at work in a week or two. I'll be back at work in a week or two. Mm. Mm. And when I started working with a neuropsychologist, he 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 was brilliant because he was saying to me, maybe you need to think about looking at that going back to work part time. Think 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 of it in those terms. Trying to maybe, soften the maybe blow. Try, maybe, maybe try a drum lesson with somebody, just just somebody just for half an hour, see how you get on. Well, that's a good idea. The lad lives down the road. I've been giving him drum lessons. So I phoned him up, said, Oh look, you know, we can we can start up again. Do do the first one for free because I don't know how I'm gonna be. Just make it half an hour, not an hour. So he came along, and after ten minutes, my brain had melted. Mm. He was asking me questions about, "Oh, how did you do that?" And it's like, I I don't know. I can do it. I, I can't play it any slow. I can't break it so that I don't know what it is. What's it called? It's a sticking range. What's it? I don't know. Mm. And he was saying. How can you not know, but you can do it? I said, I don't know. I used to know. I I can do it, but I, I, I don't know what it is. So it was like, okay, a 10-minute lesson, and my brain's melted, and I don't know what I'm doing. And then he left, and I spent the next two days in bed recovering. It's like, <sighs> I remember those recoveries. I remember them because I used to go and exert myself on a Saturday to the gym. And, or I might go for a half an hour bike ride. And when I say exert myself, I was doing light stuff, nothing major. And then the rest of the day would be wipeout, would be gone. And mm. if I was going out to dinner or to a party or something like that, late on one particular evening, might be a Friday or a Saturday night, 
I knew that I had to have nothing planned for the next day. And I would often tell my wife, do not make any plans for Sunday. I'm not interested. I'm not doing anything. I'm going to be recovering. And she's like, oh, that's a bit like, what do you mean? And I'm like, oh, I'm going to be wiped out. I can't do it. But then every once in a while, what I found was my expectation wasn't met. And then the Sunday I was fine. And I would say to her, hey, you know how that wipe out thing was going to happen? That's not happening this week today let's get on to doing whatever you had planned and it would be like wow so we would take the opportunity to make the most of that energy or or, or like great feeling or whatever it was yeah and we'd yeah. go we'd go for it but i really did plan so that if i'm going out friday for my mate's party which there's no way i'm missing on thursday i'm making sure that i'm not doing anything ridiculous i go there on friday and then i make sure i've got nothing to do on saturday so that then there's this big window so I can achieve the thing I want to achieve and get to the, the party and not miss out. Yeah, and I think that's a very important message again for people who might be looking at this and they're, you know, a few days, a few weeks, a few months into, into their stroke survivor experience is that I reckon probably for about two years I was in denial about what had happened and the magnitude of it and it took me two years to kind of adjust and get to the stage where I kind of understood what had gone on and in that two-year period I was finding I got some energy so I'll do stuff boof crash and burn week in week in bed got a bit of energy do stuff crash and burn there was no no yeah. median no no it was just up and down up and down up and down up and down and my wife eventually says to me look use the kitchen timer we've got a magnet magnetic mechanical timer that you wind up stick on the side of the fridge stick it for 50 take it with you stick it on 15 minutes when it goes off stop what you're doing and of course me being me it would go off and i'd be i'd be feeling fine so it's like, oh, let's give it another 15 minutes. <laughs> give it another 15 minutes. Goes off. That's now half an hour. I still feel okay. Give it another 15 minutes. Goes off. Yeah, I feel a bit rough now. But, and that that was then now two days in bed. And it's like, right, okay. So eventually, you learn. I, I got the message that even if I was okay, the timer went off at 15 minutes. Stop. Yeah. Because when you when you stop, when you feel bad, you've gone too far. You've gone beyond. But you're absolutely right. Um, my um, my oldest son got married last year. Uh, we're in Scotland now. They're 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 down in the south of England. So it's a seven hour drive to get down there, and we had our, our other kids to see and all the rest of it. So that was a week away, and it was planned like a military operation. It's like right, day one is travel, day two is rest day three i can do something meet some of the kids for lunch day four is rest day five that's the wedding day six is rest day seven that's the trip back diaries clear for the next week to recover from you know and that that's unfortunately for me how i have to do it i have to have to plan out but like i said to you earlier you know i had two days of doing nothing to get ready for this call I've got two days of doing nothing afterwards because I, I know I'll need that to recover from it, even though I kind of seem okay now. It, it's that how you use your time and allocate your time mm. is as much about how you allocate your time for not doing anything as you do allocate your time for doing stuff. I think uh, I completely it's agree. A pain that was me. in the ass. Yeah. Pain in the ass. It really is. But it's the only way of doing it. You see all this stuff behind me here. Yeah, when your, we, when your moved music here, equipment. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's all wired into the computer, and there's an electronic drum kit over here, and all the rest of it. To actually set it all up and unpack it all, pre-stroke, I reckon would probably be about two weeks of work. Took me about three or four months. Yeah, I because I, I also appreciate it's, that. It's just. Is it also physically a real? Yeah. Is it like? Is it 
um, like inability to kind of begin the task as well. So sometimes I struggle with beginning a task, like just trying to put in row in a row, the, the things that need to happen one after the other for the task to be initiated. Um, and it usually happens when I've got a lot of, well, some, some neurological fatigue or something like that. So it takes a while for me to get to the point where that's gone. And then when it's gone, then bang, that task can be initiated and I can do it. But task initiation is like a real challenge sometimes and i might have something that takes three months to start and do and finish in one day but the thought the just the thought process of it just drains drains me and i can't do it no matter how much it needs to be done no matter what extent of the like no matter how little it is or how big the task is there's just no bringing my brain around to the point of it feeling like it's capable of doing it it's such a yeah. weird thing yeah and uh, yeah to i totally get that bill and it's if you think about it the task of planning something is a task in itself so to get to to get to point one which is to start doing the thing still requires thought processes planning brain activity all the rest of it and if we're not in the right place for whatever reason brain processing wise it's not going to happen and the the analogy i use is it's a bit like if you've got an old computer and you load up some new software and you haven't quite gotten you've got enough ram to kind of get it going but not really enough ram to, you know or you have too many windows open and it starts going a bit slow and spooling and all the rest of it, it it's to my, it, my feeling is it's very much like that it's kind of like ah, go on go on mm. you can't oh no what, oh mm. and even looking at something can be daunting and you know i've been working on my music project which is about my stroke story um hopefully we'll raise when it's finished <laughs> uh we'll raise some money for charity and all the rest of it but but it's also partly therapy for me as well mm. to, to have a hand in doing something i i've been doing this for about eight years now and i will very often come in here with the intention of doing something and i'll turn all my gear on and I look at the screen and think, no, nah, I can't. I just, which button was it? Is it, mm. is it what, where's the manual? Um, oh, I can't read the manual. Mm. Uh, oh, no. And just turn it all off again and go, go back in the house. How bad is <laughs> it when just, you come, it's, how bad is it when you come across people because you look uh, normal, quote unquote? Yeah, you know, and people who don't get that part of the disability, the, the the invisible part of it, like how is it still frustrating? You're still coming across people like that. Does the family still misunderstand? No, luckily my my family grew up. I mean, my my wife is incredible. She's done an awful lot of research herself into the brain, stroke, brain injury, the effect, and and she she really understands it um i've got uh two boys uh my wife's got uh, a a boy and a girl i say i say boys and girls they, the youngest is 32 the oldest is 37 um <laughs> but they they that you know they 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 get it they understand but outside of a close family you know neighbors i was chatting to one of our our neighbors the other day and um he said to me oh You've got a stick. Now, we've lived here six years, right? I've bumped into him in the town when I've been doddering around with a stick. And I said, he said, you've got a stick. I said, yeah, you've seen it before, George. Oh, are you not that good at the moment? I said, no, I always walk with a stick. It's just that I've got it here now because we're in the car on our way out. Normally, if I'm sort of mooching around 
the garage and all the rest of it, you, you know, because it's level, I, I, I don't have my stick and there's a fence that I can hold on to and all the rest of it. So, oh, oh. So, you know, and, and I, I get that. I understand. Mm. It's frustrating, but I get that. I understand that because I was the same before it happened to me. I probably wouldn't have been very observant about other people, whether they had a walking stick, whether they were wobbly, whether they weren't and all the rest of it. But of course, the standard line is, you know, you, you meet people and, they, and they'll, they'll see the stick or they'll see you wobble and they'll say, oh, you all right? So and say, I used to say, yeah, I, I, I had a stroke. And the standard line would be, oh, oh you look really good. Oh, you're speaking OK, because most people and I didn't because I didn't know what a stroke was. Most people don't understand what a stroke is. So I, I generally now say, yeah, I have a brain injury. Oh, yeah, that's a smarter way to that, that gets more of a reaction, yep. more of a Attention. stop people stop and think as opposed to a stroke. Yes. Um, but you know, but it but it is frustrating. Yeah. But I, I tend now to say oh, I have a brain injury, and if it's um, if it's a, a, somebody who that doesn't sort of register when I say I have a brain injury, I'll then say. So I have brain damage. Yeah. Oh, 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 right. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh, oh. yes. I like that. I, that is I, I that's, that's like a great it. way to connect the dots really quickly in a conversation for people. Well, it's interesting, Bill, because it took me a long time to accept that myself. Right. Uh, so for a long time, I would, I would say oh, I have a stroke. My, my, Mags, my wife is. I don't know why I'm pointing at her. That's where the house is. But anyway, <laughs> um, so uh, Mags, my wife, is very good. She has to say, n n try saying you have a brain injury. Actually, I think that had more effect. And, and she's right. It, and she's absolutely right. It, it, it does. Because if somebody had said to me before I had a stroke and knew what a stroke was, I've had a stroke, I'd be like, oh, right, okay. Because the word is wrong. The, the word doesn't wrong. mean anything, does it? It doesn't actually. Uh, stroke, it, stroke, stroke, soft, strokes, nice, strokes. What we do to cats and dogs, and we stroke golf. our loved ones, and it's a. There you go, there you go. It, yeah. it it's not. Stroke doesn't generate that, and that's what it is. A, a professor of neuro rehabilitation said to me once. What you've got to realise, Andy, is that you've had your head kicked in from the inside. Well, that got That's the message it. across. Right. Okay. So yeah. you know those you know those yeah. parts of your skull that are missing. Mm. Are they never going back in? Uh, is that part of your head safe? Is it okay? What, what's the situation with that? Yeah, it's. Um, I don't know whether you can see, but round the oh, back. Yeah. Yep. So from about here down to about there is the scar. So it's kind of that sort of semicircular bit of skull is missing. So that here is all soft. Yep. There's a there's a there's a scar there. That feels yep. like the scar. But so it's about this, that that's that's never going back in because the the feeling if you have a cranioplasty where they take a bit out here or a bit out here, generally that goes back in or they give you a little helmet depending yeah. on how big the area is but the feeling was because it's around the back you tend not to bang your head around the back if you're going to bang your head it's on the front and because the skin around there is quite thick as well that that's enough so no, that's no that's that's been out uh, it does make you very sensitive to uh, climatic conditions though i found so when it's a high pressure area uh, you know, when it's a, a high pressure area moving in, System, I get yeah. really bad headaches, really bad headaches, uh -huh. because my 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 skull is no longer a closed system. Yes. So the air pressure that can get in this little hole here or all around the back there, really bizarre. I had to do research and I found other people with similar things. It's like we all have the same thing. We all much prefer a low pressure. We don't get headaches when it's low pressure, when, which is part of the reason for us moving up to Scotland from the south of England because it's generally a, a cooler climate there's less less high pressure so uh, it's it, it it makes it a bit easier on the on the head yeah that is interesting and bizarre because the weather affects me always has i prefer hot high pressure 
kind of systems and days, cold, low pressure ones don't really do me any favors. And that's not because that's of my, not. my, my head or anything. It's just always been that way. And, um, right. and now with the left side numbness, um, cold, low pressure days hurt my left side for some reason more than right. when it's hot and warmer. And I see, I feel like I always did come have, up. Did you have alive. any, did you have any midline shift? Did you have a midline shift in your brain? Do you know? It's, it's basically where where the two halves of the brain get twisted. Ah, uh, okay, no. I, I read this. I read this the other day. Somebody was saying if you had midline shift, and my hospital discharge notes said that I did with all the swelling, it kind of distorted my brain a bit. Uh, that can affect the that can affect the uh, hip, um, hypothalamus, and mm. and it can it can make you sensitive to cold or heat. It can it can it just mucks up your hypothalamus if you have a midline shift. Apparently. I never heard of it. I don't think so. Um, mine's more of a uh, neuro um, uh, sensory neuron issue. So it's very common. Uh, it's called um, yeah, I don't know what it's called doesn't matter. Um, so what happens is the the sensation on my left hand, it feels like it's numb all the time. And the sensory okay. neurons are, are hyperactive. So they feel everything even like a breeze like a slow breeze i can feel it on my so on is it head. almost like when you've had a bit of light sunburn is it that kind of something really like that sensitive then is that something right. like that right. yeah and and what it does when you feel just slight wind the wind on the skin and also on the hair follicles hurts right. so we're just talking about a light breeze wow. and in winter um that side is always colder than my right side so in winter it gets colder and the cold right. makes it hurt and then the slight breeze makes it hurt so the best way for me to avoid it is to have a lot of hot a lot of um pressure on it so at night i sleep on my left oh, side so that it's completely um being impacted directly by the mattress so that the sheets are not making my skin hurt as they kind of just right. um you know swish over the top very rarely do I sleep on yeah. my right side, although I'd like to. It's it's not it's going to keep me awake. I don't do it. So it's a very common thing with people who have uh, stroke. Um, I had a my stroke was near the cerebellum as well. It was kind of right. intra. It was not in in the cerebellum. It was kind of like just outside the cerebellum. And when the third, when the second blood clot was in there after the second bleed. I, I had nausea, vomiting and balance issues and the room was spinning and all that kind of stuff. And now my biggest issue is because of the sensory part of the situation where the numbness is impacting the message from my leg to my brain, telling my brain that it's on the ground, the right side overcompensates, it gets really stiff. And as a result of that, right. I feel like I'm kind of losing balance to my right side and my left side is always um not stable and it doesn't you know i can't ground it as much as i can ground my right side so i'm often doing the whole leaning on walls you know and all that kind of stuff around the house and sometimes yeah. when i go through walkways on my left side if i'm a if it's a tired day and it's a fatigue day i, I kind of bump into the the door frame and all that door type of frame. thing. Yeah, so same for me. I was forever getting bruises on this on this left side because I I would go over left side, and I'd think I was upright and I'd think I was going through the gap, mm. and as I go through, crash. On I was like, oh, yeah. So I, I I totally understand that, Bill. Yeah. So that's um... it's, it, it. It's it's weird because your perception is that you are upright level. When you go through a door and you crash into it, it's like I'm not. <laughs> yeah, and spatially, spatial awareness is the other issue. Is like I feel like I'm in the middle of the doorway, but I think I'm in the middle of a doorway. It appears as I'm in the middle of the doorway, but when I get to the doorway, I run into the doorway. So the whole thing is completely out of whack. Um, but most days it's not that bad, but some days it's it's worse and it's usually towards the end of the yeah. day for me in the morning i'm best 
and I reckon I'm, I'm probably good till about 2 p.m. And then after that, I need to lay off and do a lot less than I was doing in the middle of the day. So if I get up early and I can be productive, say between 8 a.m. and 2 p.m., that's usually a full day for me. And then the rest of the day is just doing minor non, non uh, highly productive things. Um, so one of the other things that's been really difficult for me is that task initiation was I'm writing a book at the moment and to get to my get myself motivated to write the book was one issue. And then to be able to sit down, say for two or three hours to write consistently and not be distracted and not have to get up and move to actually make progress on this thing was really difficult as well. So they're the little bits and pieces that um, kind of interfere, I suppose, in, in my day. But um, and that means that deadlines, you know, especially like we spoke about earlier, but deadlines on, say, completing a book are just completely ridiculous. It does, there is just no way that I can say I'm going to take a month off and finish the book in the next month because that next month might be a bad month and then, yeah. and then nothing gets done. So it's a little yeah. bit about what happens to I, me. I, 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 I totally understand that. I, um, I have found that um, making commitments incredibly difficult incredibly difficult because i cannot say with any um accuracy that if somebody wants me to be somewhere at three o'clock on tuesday next week that i can actually be there and do it i i stand more chance with something sedentary like this where i can have two days before not do anything do it two days afterwards and, and recover but in terms of um, a, a meeting for something. I mean, I started having some neuropsychology appointments up here when we moved up here to, to Scotland. And um, I ended up being kick, kicked out because I, I cancelled three appointments, three strikes and out, only found this out afterwards. I'd always phone up and say, I can't make it. Or I'd email and say, I can't make it. But it was basically... There are people queuing up for this service, and Mr. Dobie, you are unreliable, unfortunately. And it's kind of like, well, hold on, surely it's the unreliable people that will need it more than, <laughs> than everybody. <laughs> than every, you know. So I, 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 I totally get that. That so I, I don't really have much of a social life because I can't, I can't commit to be like, the number of gigs I've bought tickets for my wife and I to go to see that I that I haven't I, I don't bother now because I, there is no point in saying oh there's a band I'd love to go and see in Edinburgh in uh, in September I'll buy some tickets because I have no idea how I'm going to be when it comes to that time mm -hmm. and I've 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 not gone to more gigs than anything else in the last nine years so i just I, I just don't i just don't bother now i wait for the dvd to come out or watch the watch it on youtube or something you know? yeah yeah but that but that's how it is that's 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 the reality so what do you love to do now what, what how do you occupy your time and keep creative and do all the things that uh well how do you get some pleasure and enjoyment out of your day yeah, it, it, a lot of it depends on how I feel and what I'm up to. So I started this Brain Attack music project um, probably about, I think it was about six to nine months after my stroke. My wife had said to me, you've always been really good at writing. Why don't you, why don't you like, you know, write a book or something? So I'll start writing things down and they, they would kind of be like song lyrics. So it was like, oh, I could, I could do something. I could do something for charity, maybe my stroke story for charity. So I started mucking around with some musical ideas and I thought, well, yeah, I'm going to need a website, aren't I? So how, how, do you, how do you go about setting up a website? So researched that and set up a website. And then it was, well, I thought, oh, I could, I could, I could, I could maybe do some blogs that might help. That might help other strokes of us. So I could write some blogs. So I put some blogs on the website and then that evolved into uh, vlogs so I set up a YouTube channel so I, I, I then do videos on the YouTube channel about my stroke experience and all that. that's now podcasts so I've got so I've got podcasts set up and as, as 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 well as the music so I've got these I've, and then I've, 
started to work and you know, my blogs that I've been writing I could use those as that could go into the book so basically I've got the music project on the go a book project on the go YouTube channel on the go podcasts on the go and on the website there are there, there are blogs on the go so most of my time is about my stroke story and trying to do stuff to help other stroke survivors and that's very much up and down so I, I can do I can have a splurge where in maybe a few months I can do mainly music and I'll forget about the other stuff and then I get an idea about something to do with with a blog and, and, and I'll get obsessed about that and, and I'll spend time on, on the book and all the rest of it so I, I, before I would, I would have set myself deadlines and say right you've got to have this done by this you've got to have this done by that but I'm a bit of a sort of a bit of a butterfly now I sort of flutter around <laughs> doing different things um but that's that's really what I do to occupy my time in, 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 in you know a bit of reading bit of movie watching um listening to music is difficult i can only cope for about half an hour with listening to music i, I find my boredom threshold is dreadful now so to sit down and watch a soccer match takes too I'll long i'll get bored after 10 or 15 minutes yeah right you know when i was a kid i'd sit down and watch a cricket match all day when the test match is on the on the on the tv Tickle five days straight yeah fantastic <laughs> Dennis Dennis Lilly Jeff Thompson those guys fantastic yeah. watch that uh, now I'll, I'll flitter in and I'll watch something it's like if it doesn't grab me within a few minutes it's like no nah, 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 can't, 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 be, can't, be can't be doing that so yeah. I, t I tend to flitter around and do different stuff yeah but that's that, that that's what I do that's rem that reminds me of me um better these days but early on I, I reckon I started the podcast in 2015 and right. I, mean, I did nothing for a couple of months. Then there might be a couple of episodes and then nothing for a little while. And, and yeah, I couldn't get a consistent um, sort of run on it because I just didn't have the ability to, and it only started to get serious. I only started to really get serious with it. Maybe three or four years ago where I decided I'm going to try and release an episode a week. And I've achieved that most weeks for the last two or three years, nearly. So but that, that that's quite a tall order, isn't it? Oh, it's huge. To, 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 yeah. Huge. Yeah, that's a this big is commitment. Well, this is interview number four today. So I've got to then edit these and then I've go, got to get yeah. them off to my guy to transcribe them. Uh, and then I've got to get them on YouTube and Spotify and all the places and each episode takes between eight and 10 hours to complete my time, the other guy's time. Uh, so it's a huge undertaking. I couldn't do it on my own. And, mm. um, and I didn't have, and you can imagine like focusing and concentrating on something for eight hours. It's just not possible. It's completely not possible. It was hardly possible for me to sit down and, and be still for eight hours before the stroke, let alone after the stroke. So we're we're getting there now, and I'm I'm getting better, and um, I suppose I've trained myself as well. So I I hit my my capacities, and then I like push a little bit sweet, further. Your sweet sweet spot, as it were. Yeah, and then I push a little bit further, and then I don't, and then I do, and then right. I don't. And if I can't do anything, then nothing gets done. And sometimes nothing gets done, and I'll get a burst of energy on Sunday night at nine p.m. and and then I'll smash one out and it's like oh my god like but that's the only time i can do it because that's when it when it comes so um so i i know what you it, it's tough to get to that point though isn't it to, to to where you can kind of be happy accept adjust whatever you want to call it to that that frame of working it's 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 it takes a long time to get to that point and it's, it goes against everything you've ever been taught and told and yes. trained to do. So you have to really be different and you have yeah. to exist differently in a quote unquote normal world. You have to be different and you don't have a choice not to be, you have to be. And sometimes it doesn't work well and it interferes with lots of things and other people and the rest of it. So look, it's, it's, it's getting there, but I'm like you, you know, I've got the book project and I sit and do that when I get a, 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 some spurts of 
focus and then I do the podcast and then, you know, all that stuff. So I think it's still rewarding. I still enjoy it. I, I love doing, I love meeting people from all around the world. You know, I especially love it when people, when I put out a, a request, you know, come and come on my podcast and then 30 people respond. It's like, uh oh, that's too many. What am I going to do? All right. Well, I guess yeah, I'm going to have to interview what have I done? them. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'm going to have to interview them now. And that's why I'm doing four today. It's just, but yeah, it's, it's mental, but two years ago, I would not have been able to do four. No chance. Not in a million years. I would have canceled a couple of them for sure. I, I may have booked them, but then I would have let people down. And that's the part that I hate, right. hate the most, you know? I think that's quite a key point probably because I think we're getting near, near the end now aren't we? but I think that's a key point for, for, for people who are on the early days of their stroke journey is that you know for me it, it's it's nine and a bit years further down I, I can't remember how, how long it is for you Bill Ten. but but things things still change things mm. still improve now they might be tiny little mm. improvements they might be tiny little improvements over a, a reasonable period of time, but they're, they're still happening, you know, as opposed to after two or three years thinking, well, this is it. Mm -hmm. I'm stuck with this now. No, not at all. Not at all. I remember sitting up in hospital in the neurosurgery ward, tubes coming out of everywhere, and a physio visiting me saying, what you've got to do, Andy, is look at your recovery in six-week chunks. And I remember sitting there thinking, six-week chunks, ch ch plural, not a six-week chunk of recovery, mm. six-week chunks, plural. And in my head, I'm thinking, mate, I'll be out of here in six weeks. I'll be back at work in six weeks. What are you talking about? Six-week chunks? You're having a laugh. I think he undersold it. I think it should be six month chunks, mm -hmm. quite, quite, quite frankly, you know, because it is incredibly long term. But the fact that you're 10 years, I'm nine years, but we, we're still in a way adjusting, still discovering new things, still making little tiny improvements in, in little funny ways here and there is testament to the fact that, yeah, it's a long journey and you need to look at your recovery over a long period of time. Yeah. And it's probably open ended because I don't think either of us will get back to how we were pre stroke. Mm -hmm. Never. But, I but won't. nevertheless, the, the, the journey still continues. You can still make improvements, providing that you put the work in. Agreed. I'll be living with these deficits the rest of my life. They're not going away. They're not getting better. Uh, sorry, they're getting yeah. better. They're not going away. And um, yes, I've yes, come to yes, accept yes. that. And uh, yeah. it's kind of all right to experience this different version of my body where literally halfway down my my body like from top to bottom every part of my body right through the middle uh is different on one side different on the other side it suits my it suits my star sign i'm a gemini so you know now I'm right, right left side is one guy and right side is another guy right. Right. Uh, so you know whatever i've come to accept it uh it's not ideal and i don't enjoy it every day and sometimes i d actually dislike it uh, especially if it's a painful day or if it's a real would you, tight. Would you, would you, would you go back to how you were if you could? No. And, and I would, and the reason is, is because I have done so much personal development and so much personal growth. I'm a different version of myself than what I was all in the last 10 years. And I'm the guy that is writing the book with the working title that strokes the best thing that ever happened to me. So I wouldn't go back. And I'm not saying that it's all been roses and it's all been enjoyable. It hasn't, it's been shit and terrible and difficult and scary and, and tough on everybody, including my family and my kids and my, my parents. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we've been traumatized. So I would love to avoid the trauma, but I can't see me learning the lessons that I've learned any other bloody way. I'm that thick headed, you know? Yeah. And, and yeah, therefore, and therefore I can only take from it the whole, why would I change the growth that I've had? Yeah. My story is a post-traumatic growth story. 
not a post-traumatic stress one. There was a bit of that there, mm. but that's all gone. And now it's something else. So yeah. I can't, I can't take that life lesson away. And not only that is I never did podcasts before. I never met people from around the world. I never had in common this, these things that I have in common with so many people from around the planet. Uh, it's just completely opened my, my world to mm. things that I never knew were even on the horizon, let alone possible. Like I just didn't know about podcasts. I didn't know that they existed um, and that I could be a, a guy behind the recovery after stroke podcast and have in excess of 200 episodes and get all the comments and the feedback that I get. Like, how would you, how do you change that and go back to yeah. the old idiot that I was before that? It's not possible. <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I I agree with you totally. I um. I remember, pre-stroke, sitting in traffic jams. And they would stress me out so much. Mm. These are pre-sat nav days, right? Mm. That I would rather turn around and go in the opposite direction and be moving. Thank God I'm moving, but I'm going going away from where I want to go to try and find the back ways round. Mm. Um, that's how bad it, that's how bad my stress levels were. I'd rather go in the opposite bloody direction mm -hmm. than sit in a traffic jam. I remember another occasion where I was driving back from a gig and um, the sun was just going down and it was just the most glorious sunset. And, and it was just like, Oh God, that's look at that. That's just beautiful. Just coming up the, uh, the motorway to the, to, to, to the turn off that I would need to take to go home. And then I realized it was quarter to four in the morning and it, it was sunrise. It wasn't, it sunset. wasn't sun, sunset. It was like, oh shit, it's quarter to four in the morning and I've got my first lesson tomorrow at nine o'clock. <laughs> would I would I want those days back again? Yeah. Not 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 really. Not yeah. really. Um the uh, you know like you i've done things now post stroke that i would never have done before and yes of course there's been horrible stuff been going on and as you rightly say a lot of crap that, that goes along with it but you le you learn and you and you and you develop uh, and you and you change and, and you and you grow um and i i'm often asked oh you know you, you must miss your old life it's like no, I don't actually. I, I did, and I, I spent probably about, I would suspect, four, five years being really jealous when I'd see people that I knew playing in bands that I'd like to have played with or, or they, the, they've got a new CD out, and it's like, oh, you bastard. I, you know, it, I would really get quite mm. jealous about it, and I'd have daft romantic moments where I'd be starting to look through... Uh, the internet and see if there were bands looking for drummers and so oh, I could I, and I'd see an ad for a band looking for a drum and be like, oh that's right I, I could do that I could do that and then it would be like okay mate you could load up all your gear in the car you could drive two hours to the gig you could unload all your gear you could go up four or five flights of stairs to the stage you could unpack all your gear you could set it all up you could sound check you could then play for two and a half hours and you could then pack it all away drive home and go to work no of course mm. you couldn't mm. of course you couldn't so it was the the the, the one side which was the idealized romantic side and then the other side that's the practical you know bring you back down to earth so it's kind of like no nah, i wouldn't i wouldn't i wouldn't want to go back i've spent more time with my wife in the last nine years than i have in ever ever since we've been together and that that's been fantastic absolutely yeah. fantastic and i wouldn't i wouldn't want to lose that at all yeah there are blessings so it's, if you look it, for it's them about, it, absolutely yeah yeah mate i really appreciate you reaching out thank you so much for joining me on the podcast if some of the Pleasure. people listening wanted to find out a little bit more about you and brain attack music and your projects where would they go uh, uh, very easy brainattackmusic.com um, excellent there are links there to youtube twitter facebook 
podcasts as well as demos of some of the music and stuff about me. So brainattackmusic.com is the place to go. And I'll have all of that stuff in the show notes anyway. Thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. Wishing you well. And uh, yeah, and um, good luck on the rest of the journey. Thank you, Bill. And the same to you. It's been a pleasure to meet you, mate. Absolute pleasure. Well, thanks for joining us on today's episode. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Andy. To learn more about my guests, including their links and how to find out more about them, and to download a full transcript of the entire interview, please go to recoveryafterstroke.com slash episodes. If you would like to support this podcast, the best way to do it is to leave a five-star review and a few words about what the show means to you on iTunes and Spotify. If you're watching on YouTube, comment on the video below. If you like this episode, give it a thumbs up. And to get notifications of future episodes, subscribe to the show and hit the notification bell. Sharing the show with family and friends on social media will make a massive difference and it'll make it possible for people who may need this type of content to find it easier. And that may make a massive difference to somebody that is on the road to recovery after their own experience with stroke. One in six people will have a stroke in their lifetime. So chances are, Somebody you know has already had a stroke. And if they haven't, you know somebody that will have a stroke. So it's really important for people to know where they can get this kind of information. That's why I'm asking you to share. So thanks so much for doing that. Now, thanks for being here and listening again. I really appreciate you. I'll see you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy currency or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk and we are not responsible for any information you find there.